After watching this video, you should be able to describe the overview of metabolic biochemistry from the perspective of the liver, particularly focusing on how glucose moves in and out of the liver cell based on concentration gradients set up during fasting and well-fed state, and then listing all the major reactions and how they're affected by either the well-fed or fasting state and hormonal regulation by insulin and glucagon. So I think that the best way to think about metabolic biochemistry reactions from the um, early stages is to start really big, start with the liver since that's one of the most important uh, organs in the body where you um, have a lot of different metabolic reactions integrated together and then think about fast fasting and the well-fed state. And then once you do that, you can then zoom in on individual reactions and think about the more, uh, more detailed um, elements like uh, different uh, reaction steps and enzyme regulation. So thinking about the liver, what we want to do is think of a schematic, something that looks like this. Now, you can see here that I have a liver cell Okay, it looks real complicated, but we're going to break it down step by step. Um, and, and this liver cell is divided in half because the left side is what's going on in the liver during the fasting state, you know, when you're not eating and glucose is low. And then on the right side, this is, well, what's happening in the liver when you've eaten a meal uh, and you're well fed and the glucose is high. Okay, and you can see that in both cases, you see that glucose simply follows its concentration gradient, okay? So when there's a transporter present, glucose will um, just simply go from a high concentration to a low concentration. And that's called facilitated diffusion. And the glucose transporters that are on the liver are, are always around, which is really important. Um, you need them to always be around so glucose can go whatever direction it needs to. And, and those transporters are called GLUT2. Keep in mind that the glucose transporter that was regulated by insulin on skeletal muscle and adipocytes that was discussed in the previous video that was regulated, it was translocated to the membrane and inserted when insulin was present and then it was sequestered when insulin was low, um, that glucose transporter was called GLUT4 which is regulated in a much different way. So you can think of these as always being around, constitutively expressed on the hepatocyte and they simply let glucose go down its concentration gradient. So if we start with the left side, the fasting state, we can see that the glucose is low, we have hypoglycemia, and the liver's important role under this, under this particular situation is that it needs to supply the plasma with some glucose to stabilize the plasma glucose and prevent the glucose from going down even further. So the liver is very important for that. And so we can see that in the liver, we need to have a high concentration of glucose developed so it can then flow out of the liver cell and supply the plasma, which then can go off to insulin-independent uh, tissues like the brain or places like that, and they can take up the glucose and use it for energy in making ATP. Okay. Now, where does this glucose come from? Well... The, the intermediate that's integral for all the metabolic pathways involving glucose metabolism is glucose 6-phosphate. And we can see here that we're generating glucose 6-phosphate a couple of different ways. First place that we can get it from is glycogen stores that are in the liver. And, and the liver is, is, is a very important location where glycogen is found. Um, and that is going to help supply the carbons to make the glucose 6-phosphate and ultimately make glucose. And so there's the glycogen being broken down. That's called glycogenolysis, okay? And then we have the G6P, which can go off to glucose. And then we also have pyruvate, and you need a couple of them to get together because these are three carbon fragments, that through a variety of different steps that we're not going to go into here called gluconeogenesis, uh, you make glucose 6-phosphate. And in fact, um, we, we consider this step going from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose also gluconeogenesis too. And we can see that with gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, um, in effect, we're going to be getting our glucose 
to increase inside the liver cell so it could flow out of the liver cell. All right. Now, the interesting thing here is that gluconeogenesis requires ATP. It's an energy requiring process. And so you go, well, where does this ATP come from? And in fact, you might be wondering, where, where does this pyruvate come from? And, and actually, um, in another video, we go into gluconeogenesis, you'll see that this pyruvate was generated from carbon coming into the liver from protein breakdown, like glucogenic amino acids, maybe even some lactate. And, and so this pyruvate is important, you know, as a carbon source. But, you know, when you think about uh, pyruvate, in the well-fed state, it goes into the, it goes into the mitochondria, and you and you it go and ultimately makes acetyl CoA and makes um, um, ATP through the uh, TCA cycle and electron transport chain. This pyruvate isn't being isn't being used to make ATP; it's being used for its carbon going back. So where did that ATP going to come from? Well, actually, where it comes from is the fatty acids that are released from adipocytes. Okay, when you break down triglycerides and fat cells, they're released. And the fatty acids are picked up by the, by the hepatocytes and they're oxidized through fatty acid oxidation. That, that occurs in the mitochondria, which isn't shown here. And the acetyl-CoA that you get then can go into the TCA cycle, ultimately electron transport chain, and make the ATP okay, uh, to provide the energy to run gluconeogenesis. So acetyl-CoA going into the TCA cycle um, also, you get a little bit of um, um, energy coming off just from oxidizing fatty acids. That's the energy source to keep gluconeogenesis running. That's very important. And the other thing that happens when you oxidize fatty acids, and another thing that happens is acetyl-CoA, is that it can be shunted, if you have a lot of it, into ketone bodies. For example, beta-hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate. And those are, you could think of as acetyl-CoA carriers. They, they go into the plasma. They're... They, they, they are acid, so they, they, the downside is they lower the pH, and other tissues can use ketones as a, as a secondary fuel source to generate acetyl-CoA and ultimately make ATP, okay? So in the fasting state, we have glycogenolysis active, we have gluconeogenesis active, we have lots of fatty acid oxidation, we have lots of ketogenesis, a lot of ketone body synthesis. Okay, and that's all logical based on the idea that, you know, you have tissues out here, non-liver tissues, that are running really low on energy. They really want glucose, but also they can use some ketones possibly as a, as a second option. And that's what's going on here in the liver in the fasting state, okay? And um, I, I think that's pretty well explained by, by, this, by this simplified um, diagram. Now, if we go to the other side of the coin, the well-fed state, Okay, where we've eaten a meal, we have lots of glucose, we want to store energy, right? And, and the liver is a very important place for that. You know, the liver is going to clear some of that glucose. We discussed in another video with the insulin effects that insulin is going to promote glucose uptake in skeletal muscle and fat, and that's certainly important too. But since we're focusing on the liver, the glucose is going to be taken up here too, and you can see that that glucose uptake is going to be very dependent on... Um, that glucose being phosphorylated to G6P to maintain that concentration gradient so it can be continue to be taken up. And that's actually an important consideration. And once that G6P is made, you know, you can have it go the other way into making glycogen, all right? That's called glycogenesis, all right? And it also can go down glycolysis, the glycolytic pathway, a variety of steps, which we're not going to go into here. And you make type 2 pyruvate. Now see the difference here is the pyruvate that we're, that we're considering here was made from glucose oxidation, okay? The pyruvate that we have over on the fasting side, that's made from conversion of glucogenic amino acids and maybe lactate. Um, it wasn't obviously made through gly gly glycolysis because glycolysis actually is turned off as we're going to see in, um, in just a second. So where, where is this pyruvate going to go? Well, it's going to go into the mitochondria, it's going to be converted to acetyl-CoA, and the acetyl-CoA under these conditions, they're going to be made ultimately in the fatty acids and cholesterol, and, and actually those things occur in the cytosol, which we'll discuss later in another video. And you make fatty acids, fatty acid biosynthesis. You remember triglycerides are um, a glycerol backbone that sugar is going to come off of um, the glycolytic pathway, and you're going to get those fatty acids linked together with the glycerol backbone. You're going to make triglycerides.
and then you're going to throw in some cholesterol in there and um, it's going to be all packaged together with some, some other protein and that's going to go off as VLDL which is then going to deliver that stuff, those uh, triglycerides ultimately to um, tissues like the adipose which will then pick up the fatty acids and then store it as fat. Okay, so you can see that we're in a, in a, in a energy storage mechanism over here with the well-fed state. Now the other pathway that's important here that's shown is this little shunt, this G6 phosphate that kind of goes off and then it comes back in. That's called the, the pentose phosphate shunt or hexomonophosphate shunt. Um, the, in, this, in this particular case, the NADPH is very important because that's going to be um, necessary to do these reductive biosynthetic reactions like making fatty acids and cholesterol. Okay, so, so, th so we want that active because we need to have the NADPH for those processes. Okay, so I think that um, if you start off with the big picture with these major reactions and the flow of where glucose and some of these fatty acids are going, um, it's very helpful to kind of put it all in perspective of how these reactions are related to one another and how they're ultimately going to be regulated. Okay, now that takes us to um, our, our consideration of the, of the pathway names themselves. Okay, and so what I have here, and remember we're just talking about the liver, um, some of these reactions in fact are liver specific uh, or, or, or they're, they're mostly occurring in the liver. You know, for example, ketogenesis, that's really a, only a, a liver metabolic reaction, whereas some of these other ones like glycolysis, they're kind of everywhere, okay? So, so I want you to still stick with me and, and just focus on these things just in the liver for now, and then as we talk about other places, but we can go into some specifics, okay? So what I have on the left side in the liver are all the reactions that are all going to be grouped together because when one of these is turned on, all of these are turned on. Or when one of these is turned off, all of these are turned off. So that's why they're all grouped together this way. And the other nice thing about this is that if you see on the other side, we have all of our other reactions are all grouped together, but the opposing reactions are kind of lined up next to each other, okay? So glycolysis, like we just looked at, takes a, if we go back to our picture, glycolysis takes glucose and goes through a variety of steps to make 2-pyruvate. Okay, that whole thing's called glycolysis. Okay, if I take 2-pyruvate and go all the way back to glucose, that's called gluconeogenesis. Okay, so in a sense, they're, they're really opposite reactions. And, and in fact, um, they use a lot of the same enzymes, actually. Uh, there are some different ones that, that, that we'll get to when we actually um, talk about these reactions in more detail. But you can see that these arrows are going opposite directions, okay? Same thing for glycogen metabolism. You can see here we have glyco, um, glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen, and we also have gly glycogenesis, the synthesis of glycogen, okay? So I, I think um, we go back to uh, this diagram here. We got glycolysis and gluconeogenesis lined up. We got glycogenesis and glycogenolysis lined up, and then we have fatty acid biosynthesis, you know, where you're, oxid, uh, where you're, you're synthesizing fatty acids, and then you have fatty acid oxidation, which is where you're breaking them down, you're taking fatty acids and you're making acetyl-CoA, as opposed to taking acetyl-CoA and making fatty acids. And then I also, uh, these are linked together, you know, you need fatty acids to make triglycerides, so, so I kind of put these together, and you need acetyl-CoA from fatty acid oxidation to make ketones and that's why they're kind of grouped together here too. And then over here we have pentose phosphate shunt which we discussed makes the NADPH. There really isn't an opposite uh, reaction um, in, in, in this grouping over here so that's why that's sort of left blank. Okay and like I said when, when one of these is on all of these are on. When one of these is off all of these are off. And when um, these guys are all on, okay, over here, then all the other ones in the other group, they're all turned off and vice versa. And so that makes sense because we don't want to have uh, opposite reactions occurring at, at the same time. Then you just kind of go around in a circle, okay? So if we now add in some regulation, which is now the last part of this video, we can say, well, what happens, for example, under the situation of fasting, okay? So, go over here, 
and we can say, well, what happens if we have um, glucagon, right, which would be high during fasting? Glucagon, okay. Well, as you know, glucagon's major function is to raise the plasma glucose. So I don't think it's a big surprise that it's going to turn on all of these reactions, okay? Glyco, uh, glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, fatty acid oxidation, and ketogenesis. And at the same time, okay, at the same time, glucagon is going to turn off all of these reactions. So you're going to want glycolysis off, you're going to want glycogenesis off, you're going to want fatty acid synthesis and triglyceride synthesis off, and you don't want the pentose phosphate shunt uh, occurring as well, right? You want to be making glucose, okay? And so that's how glucagon would be working, and of course, glucagon would be high if you were fat, would be high in the fasting state, right? If you had low blood sugar, okay? Now, if we think about insulin, okay, insulin, well. Insulin is going to do the exact opposite. So when you have lots of insulin around, when you're in the well-fed state, you want the liver to be taking up glucose. You want to be oxidizing the glucose to pyruvate. You want to make um, fatty acids. You want to make glycogen. You need the pentose phosphate shunt to provide the NADPH. And so this is going to be turned on. Okay? And of course, if that's occurring then insulin is going to want these reactions turned off. Okay, gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, fatty acid oxidation, and ketogenesis. Okay, and keep in mind, just like we discussed in the other videos, glucagon is going to be mediating its effects through cyclic AMP and PKA. Because remember, um, the glucagon receptor is coupled to GS, right? The glucagon receptor increases CAMP and, and PKA. So when we think about where all the targets of PKA and what they're going to be doing, they're going to be phosphorylating things and doing things to turn on gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, fatty acid oxidation, and ketogenesis. And at the same time, PKA and, and um, through its phosphorylations is going to be turning all of these opposing reactions off. Okay, now, now remember insulin is a little different it uses an RTK pathway, remember, um, that's a lot more complicated. Um, the insulin receptor, remember, is an RTK, and that uses the PI3 kinase AKT pathway, um, um, and, that, and that's going to have its own effects to have um, all these processes, glycolysis, glycogenesis, fatty acid synthesis, triglyceride synthesis, and pentose phosphate shunt all turned on, and the opposing reactions turned off. Okay, so this is the important framework because whenever you are thinking about what the effect of PKA is going to be on a particular enzyme, for example, you can really figure it out quite easily because if you know PKA is part of a glucagon pathway and you know what glucagon should be doing to these reactions in the liver, you could figure out in the liver what PKA would be doing to that enzyme. You don't have to memorize that. And that's a really important point because there's lots of enzymes and it gets real complicated, especially when you're thinking about all the possible things that protein kinase A can phosphorylate, for example. Okay? So if we go back to our diagram, our schematic here, in the fasting state, we would expect glucagon to be high, insulin to be low, and all of these reactions facilitating glucose output to be turned on, as well as ketone output and all the opposing reactions to be turned off. And in the well-fed state, when we have lots of insulin around and low glucagon, we're going to be expecting to be facilitating glucose uptake, synthesis of glycogen, synthesis of fatty acids, cholesterol, and triglycerides, VLDL, which is going to uh, carry around triglycerides to fat cells and other places, and we're going to be in an in a energy storage mode. Okay, And the effects on glucose are critical to understanding that. So uh, we go back to where we started. Um, if you think big picture, uh, uh, think liver first, uh, think about glucose going in and out of the liver cell based on its concentration gradient, that really sets up 
um, how you think about the fasting and well-fed state and all the metabolic reactions that are occurring in the liver that you then can extend to other tissues um, once you start with this framework. And that concludes this video on the overview of metabolic biochemistry uh, looking from the liver's perspective.